So welcome everybody. Our speaker today is Alex Waldron from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and he will talk about the harmonic map flow for almost holomorphic maps. Thank you for coming and please go ahead. Good. So thank you very, very much to the organizers for the invitation. Um, so my talk will be about, uh, well, wait, let's see. Good. So my talk will be about a joint paper from last year with Chong Song, uh, who's at Xiamen University. Um, so uh, let's, let me remind you, uh, or introduce you to the context, which is about uh, maps from one Riemannian manifold to another, uh, in particular harmonic maps. But so uh, let's say we have a map between two Riemannian manifolds. Uh, so I'll take them to be compact, but of course many of the results uh, hold when in, in more slightly more generality. So what is the energy of a map? Uh, well, the energy density uh, it, you can simply take the norm of the derivative squared. Uh, and how do you take the norm of the derivative exactly in this way? You use the metric on H uh, on N and the metric on M, which I'll call H and G respectively. So this is the local expression for the energy density. Um, and if you integrate over the manifold, uh, you get the a Dirichlet functional for maps, which is quite the same. Uh, as for uh, uh, scalar functions, uh, except now we're, we're restricting to maps from one Riemannian manifold to another. Um, so here's uh, the Dirichlet functional. So now a uh, harmonic map is a critical point of this functional, uh, analogous to a harmonic function. So uh, there are two common ways to formulate the harmonic map condition. There's the extrinsic formulation. So this is where we would assume that the target manifold N is isometrically embedded in Euclidean space. And then the harmonic map equation uh, says that the tangential component of the Laplacian of U vanishes. So uh, it, it's a fairly simple looking equation. In fact, um, um, it's, a, it's a, a nice well-behaved equation. So if N is in Euclidean space, then uh, all we're saying is that the Laplacian of the map as a map to RK, the tangential component vanishes. Uh, that's the extrinsic formulation. Now, uh, in fact, in our paper, we work with the intrinsic formulation. Uh, so the intrinsic formulation says that U is a harmonic map if and only if the tension field vanishes. Um, so the tension field is given by the trace of the covariant derivative of the uh, differential of the map. Uh, or in coordinates, uh, you ha we have the following expression for the tension field. So as you see, it's uh, the Laplacian of each component of the map uh, plus some lower order terms, uh, the second one of which is nonlinear. Both nonlinear, it's the square of the derivative and there's a U, the map appears uh, in the connection of the target manifold, which is involved in uh, defining this covariant derivative uh, up there. Uh, but as you see, it turns out to be a semilinear uh, equation uh, with a very nice nonlinearity. Um, so we tend to prefer the intrinsic formulation because we need Bachner formulae, which are, I think, easier to derive in the intrinsic formulation. But for analysis, uh, it's often easier to look at the extrinsic formulation where it's obvious what is a Sobolev space of maps it would be simply a, a space of all uh, Sobolev functions uh, RK valued functions that are almost everywhere in the manifold. Uh, but we, we, today we mostly talk about smooth uh, maps. So this, these are harmonic maps. Um, now, today's talk is about the harmonic map flow. Uh, so harmonic map flow is the parabolic approach to harmonic maps, whereby you simply follow uh, the 
tension field. So you evolve a map by its tension field. In fact, the tension field is the, uh, the L2 gradient of the Dirichlet energy. Um, so by definition, if I, if I can solve this equation, since I'm following the downward gradient, uh, the energy will be decreasing along the flow. And the idea is, of course, that uh, if I'm able to solve it up to infinite time, since E of U of T is a positive decreasing uh, function, then uh, it will asymptotically be constant. And uh, if I can get a limit as T goes to infinity, that should uh, have D dt equals zero. It should be a harmonic map. Moreover, if this is a smooth flow, then I'm deforming the map within the initial homotopy class. So my limit at infinite time would be a harmonic map in the same homotopy class as the initial map. So that's the ideal picture. And in fact, Eels and Sampson, 1964, they introduced this uh, harmonic map flow. And they showed that if the sectional curvature of the target is negative, sorry, is non-positive, then in fact, it works beautifully and perfectly. Uh, you have a smooth solution for all time and it converges at infinite time to a harmonic map in the same homotopy class. So you have a theorem that um, any map from any manifold to a negative sectional curvature, non, sorry, non-positive sectional curvature manifold is homotopic to a harmonic map. And that is the seminal theorem of uh, geometric flows and harmonic maps. So now, um, what if we remove this curvature assumption on N and take a more general target manifold that's not necessarily uh, non-negative sectional curvature, which is of course a very restrictive assumption. So if we remove this restriction, then unfortunately we sort of leave the paradise of Eels and Sampson. Um, and uh, we have a much more difficult time, but much, well, also things get interesting. So then uh, the, the, the main feature is that the behavior depends on the dimension of the domain M. So let's say the dimension of the domain is one then a harmonic map is actually just a geodesic. And indeed the flow will deform the initial map to a geodesic. Uh, so in dimension one, things still work perfectly. Um, now in dimension greater than two, that's the supercritical case. Uh, and in the supercritical case, um, you have quite an abundance of blow up happening. Um, so in, in supercritical dimensions, you get typically uh, type one blow up, which means sort of the simplest possible blow up in which um, your map is shrinking parabolically uh, into the singularity. That's the typical behavior in supercritical dimensions. And uh, as I draw it here, uh, so type one um, means if that the, the singularity in fact uh, will be moving at the characteristic parabolic scale where uh, the characteristic radius is the square root of the time to the singular time. So that's actually um, in some sense, the fastest possible uh, blow up. Uh, maybe one should say that's something, something's called a rapidly forming singularity because it forms all of a sudden, it doesn't take its sweet time. It just boom, blows up. Okay. so. Uh, now in the middle between the subcritical supercritical is the critical dimension, dimension two. And so in dimension two, the uh, Dirichlet energy is conformally invariant. Um, and in, in fact, the consequence of that is that under the flow, you cannot have this uh, type one blow up, which is by uh, sh like sort of shrinking scaling but only type two blow up is conceivably possible. And so a type two blow up as I drew it here um, means that the singularity takes in some sense, it, it has to kind of meander inwards um, 
in actually you think of this as a more slow way. So type two would be called a slowly forming singularity. Of course, there's some confusion because um, if, if you match them up so that they happen at the same time, type two um, would be, the scale would be smaller. So you might think that's a faster singularity, but really that should be thought of as a slower blow up, something more subtle uh, happening. Than the type one. And so in the critical dimension, only a type two blow up is possible. So then uh, you might ask whether a type two blow up can actually occur uh, in the critical dimension. And so that wasn't somehow so easy to determine in, in the 80s. But uh, it was shown by Chang, Ding, and Yi uh, in 1992 that indeed harmonic map flow in dimension two can blow up in finite time. So uh, here is the example, Chang Ding Yi's example. So to get a finite time blow up in dimension two, uh, all I have to do is take, consider maps from the disc to the two sphere, two disc to the two sphere, which are uh, rotationally symmetric. So you see these, uh, Lun, uh, latitude lines are uh, preserved by the uh, flow. And so the, the theta angle is, is preserved here. Uh, but I have a variable where the uh, angle from the North Pole is a function of the uh, radius on the disk. Uh, so I call that phi of r comma t. And uh, harmonic map flow reduces to this nice uh, scalar one-dimensional evolution equation here. DT phi is dr squared phi plus one over r dr phi minus sine two phi over two r squared. So this sine two phi is a nice uh, uh, zeroth order nonlinearity here. Uh, and of course we have this one over r is one over uh, r squareds here. Uh, so it's not such a tame equation uh, and in fact, what does happen is that uh, if I start with some initial data here, um, so I take a Dirichlet boundary condition where in fact, you, what you have to do is pull the map slightly over the South Pole. And then I run the flow. So what first that initial data will smooth out a little bit because uh, it's parabolic and it has smoothing property. And then what happens is it will start to uh, concentrate at the origin, you see the flow lines, uh, <laughs> sorry, the uh, uh, circles spreading out there. Um, and then suddenly after say 0.3 seconds, not seconds, 0.3 time units, it will blow up and the solution will be discontinuous. And in fact, it will change its homotopy class. after only finite amount of time. Um, and so th this, the, this is a funny, very there's famous example to me. Um, sorry, was there a question? Yes, sorry, there's a question in the chat that I'm going to read. So oh, can please. you explain again how the sine two phi term arises? What's the physical meaning? The physical meaning? Um, well, I suppose you could say that it's the constraint. Uh, it's enforcing the constraint that uh, my map from the disk to the sphere will, will remain in the sphere. That would be the extrinsic way to put it. Uh, the intrinsic way would be that the sphere uh, has a levi civita connection, which, um, which gives you a zeroth order nonlinearity, which turns out to be of this nice form. I don't know if that uh, helps, but in any case, this is the equation you get when you uh, run it through. Does it arise from a Lagrange multiplier type of constraint? I'm just. Um, I, yeah, I suppose you, you could you could uh, formulate it that way. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Does it have a negative sign? Because that would seem to push feed down. Yeah, the nonlinearity. Uh, so it, 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 it. Uh, I think it, 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 it does have a negative sign, uh, like that. Yeah. 
so the, the, the nonlinearity kind of almost helps you, but it, it uh, well, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure how to, it depends at which critical point. I suppose that uh, the zero and pi kind of help you, but then the pi over two is pushing you in. I don't know if that's an appropriate uh, way to look at it. But actually Hamilton told me uh, that he, he looked at this um, or, or in the late eighties. And uh, what he did was he didn't put, he put the Dirichlet boundary condition exactly at the pole. <laughs> uh, and then he saw uh, if, if you do that, then actually it doesn't blow up in finite time. You get like a nice uh, infinite time singularity. And so I think he may have conjectured privately that uh, the flow didn't have singularities in dimension two. Uh, but then all you have to do is stretch it a little bit past the pole <laughs> and then it'll go there in a, in a finite amount of time. So, uh, and the other thing is actually, if you take a twice wound map, if you if you um, uh, make it make a degree two map where it winds around twice or more, then also that keeps it from blowing up in finite time. You get a you get a uh, infinite time singularity that way, um, which is which is something I was very interested in in graduate school because that one more resembles Yang Mills flow, which which is what I was what I work on. Um, So it's a much studied system. I'll actually mention a, a few more results about this system uh, on a later slide. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so uh, what is the general picture in dimension two? So that was just the rotationally symmetric, uh, a rotationally symmetric example. Um, so in fact, before that example was, was written up uh, in the mid eighties, uh, Strube, constructed a global weak solution, which does go all the way up to infinite time, except that you have to um, allow for finitely many singular points and times. Um, so Struve con constructed a solution where uh, the energy is decreasing. In fact, I think it's unique uh, if, the, if you impose that the energy is decreasing, uh, but it will, it will jump down uh, at finitely many times on your way to infinity. Now, why finitely many times is that uh, there's an epsilon regularity theorem uh, saying that in order to form a singularity, you need at least a, a certain small amount of energy, epsilon zero. Uh, so each singular time consumes a uh, finite, uh, a, a bounded away from zero amount of energy. So there can only be finitely many. Um, so you do get a global weak solution with these singularities popping up. Um, so then the, the task is uh, to understand the singularities, just like with so many other uh, geometric flows. So uh, I'll now give you a uh, summary of what's known about the singularities. And then on the next slide, I'll draw a picture, which may help to, to visualize. Um, so this is through the work of a number of people. Uh, I may even be omitting some, some names. Um, so in the Struve solution, if you have a singular time, then what you can do is uh, take a sequence of times. In fact, uh, you, you may wanna choose it well, uh, take a sequence of times approaching the, the singular time. Then what you get is a number one, a body map, which we call kind of abusive notation U of T, capital T, which is a W12 map um, and a finite set of points uh, where there are going to be singularities. And at those points, you get bubbles. Uh, this is a very typical picture. Um, so at the singular points, you get bubbles, which are in fact also harmonic maps, but the domain changes. The domain is S2 uh, with the same target, uh, such that the following holds. So you have convergence uh, smoothly away from the singular set and weakly overall. Uh, you have an energy identity, which says that um, the limit of the energy approaching the time is all accounted for by the energy of the body map plus the energy of all the bubbles. There are finitely many bubbles. 
So uh, you can actually recover all of that. The, the energy that's lost in those jumps is accounted for by the energies of harmonic spheres. I'll draw a picture on the next slide. Um, good. So beyond that, you, you have that uh, the bubbles <laughs> are connected to each other. Um, in fact, so the bubbles at any given singular point, there, there can be more than one bubble. It's called a bubble tree at the singular, at, at one singular point. They are all connected to each other, which is a, a non-trivial result. Um, and if it, so if you consider t equals infinity, then yes, you get a body map, it's harmonic, and that map is also connected to the bubbles. And so uh, this analysis is essentially uh, follows from an analysis of uh, almost harmonic maps. In other words, uh, local analysis of almost harmonic maps, say from the disk to, to uh, the same target. So that's where the tension field is tending to zero in uh, L2 as n tends to infinity. Um, I would look at uh, some of uh, Professor Topping's papers where he, he, he states this whole picture uh, probably a little bit more accurately than I did here. Um, but so here's the picture uh, in picture form. <laughs> um, my co-author made this uh, drawing borrowing it with his permission. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> as you approach the singular time, what you do is you, you, you take a singular point and uh, you want to rescale. And so here I've drawn it um, where you, you can rescale in many different ways. You can either take the, the smallest scale where you capture a non-zero amount of energy, or you could take the largest scale uh, where, whereby you capture all of the concentrated energy. Um, and so I'll discuss, uh, hopefully I'll get to discuss more uh, how to do the outer scale. So I think, uh, yeah, so we in our paper, we look at the outer scale. So the outer scale is where you try and capture all of the energy that, that pops into the point, and then you rescale uh, to make that scale one. So that's the rescaling. Um, and then you would get, you look at a, a subsequential limit there, uh, which will be a harmonic map. It may be a trivial one, maybe non-trivial. Um, and then you, you look at the singularities in that bubbling picture, and then you rescale there, and you then you look at that and rescale again. And what you get overall is called the bubble tree, which is drawn here. Um, and so this is a, a bubble tree. It's harmonic maps, which are connected by uh, necks. And what you can do is capture all of the energy that's concentrating into a certain point uh, at, by this rescaling procedure, if you're, if you're careful. So that's the energy identity. Um, and now in the limit, these necks will become uh, thin and won't, won't account for any energy, but it is possible that they'll have some length, uh, which is a big problem in the uh, field, I would say. So the, um, what, you, what you then show is that the bubbles, uh, that these necks actually have zero length. So the, neck, the necks between the bubbles actually will have zero length. Uh, that was, that's known, that's stated on the, on the last slide. What is not known is whether the neck between the bubble tree and the body map has non-zero length. Um, so yeah, maybe, uh, I, I'm not sure this was totally clear, um, but of course it can be made totally clear. <laughs> uh, so are there, uh, is there a question about this sort of, uh, bubbling picture, bubble tree picture? It wouldn't be, uh, clear if it were your first time, uh, seeing I, it. I have a question that's more in the flavor of a comment just to help me clarify for myself. Good. Um, the, the, you know, the, if one looks slightly before that degeneration, what you have is a very degenerating formal structure to the surface. So having a really, having a non-zero distance has that quality, right? So it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it, I mean, I guess even having a degeneration is a degenerating conformal structure, but is there, is there a way to think about 
having the long neck as sort of a rate at which that conformal structure degenerates? Well, so, I mean, one thing is that actually we do fix the conformal structure. So, um, yeah, like if this were mean curvature flow uh, or Teichmuller harmonic map flow, the conformal structure would be changing, but actually we, we just fix the domain metric. So in that sense, harmonic map flow is maybe a little yeah. more boring than some other things. Right, right. Let, let me say it differently. Mm -hmm. it's, obviously I'm comparing the induced conformal structure, which is different because it's a harmonic map, not a, not a minimal surface. Gotcha. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's the comparison of the yes. induced and the fixed one. That's, that's where I'm just, it it, makes sense. Cause, mm -hmm. Because I think even when you have just a, a zero distance neck, I mean, a, ca a catenoid neck is an annulus with infinite modulus or almost infinite modulus. So I'm trying to distinguish yes. what's going on with the distance. You know, is there a way to think of the distance in a, in a, in a way that's sort of, um, um, I mean, it, it, well, anyway. So, me... so yeah, so you, you exactly, you have the same annuli. Um, so it's annuli where, you know, one or the other, either the inner radius is going to zero or the outer radius is going to infinity, depending how you rescale. Um, and what you see in what the annulus is being mapped onto that neck, uh, just as, as, okay, actually, I, I'm not sure this is, um, <laughs> what, what I assume is that the annulus is being mapped um, to a geodesic. So the neck, um, I think you'd expect it to be a geodesic because that's, that's a harmonic map. So if you take right, an right. annulus sure. and yep, map and just collapse it as a cylinder, um, that is a harmonic map. Um, but the, the, mm -hmm. so then the, the trick is that um, why it doesn't cost any energy is that um, the energy is L2 of the derivative of the map, but uh, to get a non-zero distance, you just need an L1, which is yep. not vanishing. Yep. Yeah, yeah so, clear, clear. So that's what's happening. Okay, so there's there's no way to capture it in the degeneration of the conformal. So the other question is that there, there, when you're outside of the Kähler target, it, there, there are settings where you actually do get that that geodesic neck, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Next yeah, yeah. slide. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yep. yep. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. So so the main question, um, I would say the remaining questions from uh, what's known is that, okay, if we have a singular time, um, yeah, actually, I, 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 I didn't say it's not just the neck, but the body map um, is only a W12 map. Um, okay, so, so the question is, um, is, is it better than a W12 map, the, the, the body stuff, when you throw out all the bubbles? Um, so, for instance, so you, the next best, well, I mean, you, <laughs> What you want to know is whether U of T is actually continuous at the singular points. Or in other words, um, is, the, is the point that you remove, is that a removable discontinuity? Um, and if yes, it doesn't, I'd say if yes, then uh, you can ask about the neck. So then is uh, U of T connected to the bubble tree? In other words, is there no neck? Uh, or in other words, is the, the value um, of the body map at that point contained in the union of the images of the bubbles. That would sometimes be called the no neck property, but I, I don't necessarily want to say that because later in the talk, I will keep referring to the neck. Uh, <laughs> so it depends what you mean by neck. Okay, so does the body map have better regularity? And if so, is it even connected to the bubbles? Um, this is the major remaining question. Okay, so here, here are some results on this. So uh, Jia Ching, 2003, he showed that uh, the body map has uh, like, it's asymptotically radial at the singularity. So in other words, roughly speaking, it is tending to, to just shoot along a geodesic uh, where the circles are being contracted um, to zero. Um, and then uh, Peter Topping has a result from 2004, which says that if you assume something about how the energy is spent uh, as you approach the singularity, as you approach the singular time, in fact, you just ha have to assume that it's holder continuous in 
the t variable. So this is the total energy of the map E of u of t. So if that's whole or continuous in t, in t, so you know, including up to capital T, then in fact the body map is also continuous. In fact, uh, Hilder continuous in the x variable. So that's a very nice uh, result. Um, but we we don't. I don't know how a priori one one would be able to uh, check the Hilder continuity of of the energy. Um, but still, it's a it's a um, sets a standard for what what could be proved. And now, the the big bad news in harmonic map flow is that, in fact, u of t does not have to be continuous at the singular point. So this is false in general. <coughs> so. Uh, Topping in the, this around the same time as the, the other paper, he uh, actually wrote down an explicit counterexample to the continuity of the body map. <laughs> so the way the counterexample works is you you fix you you construct a rather pathological target manifold. Roughly speaking, the target manifold is a is a product of uh, I think a torus and a, an S two. It contains a geodesic that that's like a <clears throat> infinite length geodesic. Um, well, actually, I, I, okay, I, I might get this wrong, but <laughs> um, roughly speaking, what what happens is that you 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 manage your topic managed to send the um, the sphere. So it's say the domain is a sphere, he, or a, yeah, he managed to send the bubble along a geodesic, whizzing around for an infinite length and. Um, because the bubble is whizzing around so fast, the body map actually gets stretched all the way along a infinite length, sort of irrational geodesic uh, in a torus. And that all happens within finite time. So, which it, which it has to other because in fact, at infinite time, um, U of T is known to be continuous. Um, but so, so that's very bad news for harmonic map flow. But the good news is that that is a very pathological metric uh, on the target. Um, and the other, so that's a, a quite amazing paper where, where this is constructed. And in fact, not only does he show, show that it, you get this singularity, uh, but he shows that the blow up rate <coughs> of the singularity is uh, it's still type two necessarily, but it's as close as possible to the type one rate. In other words, um, it's vanishing faster, sorry, or <laughs> maybe I put it the wrong way. Yeah. Um, it's vanishing at, at, at least as fast as T minus T to the half plus epsilon. So T minus T to the half would be the type one rate. Um, and so, so, um, that's, that's, that's a very drastic, um, sort of blow up behavior. So in the same paper, uh, Topping conjectured that, uh, if the metric on the target is not so bad, um, not just that, if, if the metric is real analytic, uh, then the body map will indeed be continuous. So obviously the counterexample is not real analytic, um, but the, oh, pardon me. Um, I believe my screen sharing was messed up, is that correct? It's working fine for me. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, for me, something happened. It, it, uh, someone tried to install an update on my computer. And, uh, yeah, let me try again here. There we are. Apologies. 
Good. So uh, the, the conjecture is that if n is real analytic, then u of t will be continuous. Uh, and the on, Alex, Alex, I think you may have shared the wrong window. I can see a, your preview. Oh, that's OK. Sorry for all, all that. Okay, uh, should be back and now let me go to the full screen again. Okay, are we, <laughs> uh, are we back on the slide? Yes. Good. It, I hope that we never left, but on my machine, it, it did uh, cancel out of it. Okay. So uh, the motivation for this conjecture is is not just that the counterexample does not <laughs> is not real analytic, but it has to do with the Loyasevich inequality, um, which you get on n when n is real analytic. Except that um, this is about bubbling, and we don't know how to yet how to use Loyasevich inequalities uh, in the context of bubbling. Uh, we now have work by Kolding, Minakotsi, and others uh, in mean curvature flow we're, we're about using Loyasevich in, inside singularities, but it hasn't. Uh, um, in, and we're starting with with uh, Malachiotti, Rupflin, and Sharp, and. Uh, uh, Rupflin again to get Loyasevich inequalities that we can use to control bubbling, but uh, it's a very incipient uh, area. Okay, so th this is a, a, a conjecture which I think should be better, more famous than it is even. I think it's very interesting conjecture. Uh, okay, questions or Just one, and maybe Peter can chime in. So, so you, how continuous is UT? I mean, what, what what's the? This is the map. This is the map at the at the singular time. So, so what's what's the? Is there any any modulus of continuity? Is it, what, what is? I, I I would guess that uh, based on the uh, the his paper from two thousand four, you can make a guess about. Um, um, it would probably depend on the exponent that you would get in the Loyasevich inequality uh, on n. What the you could guess that you'd get a Holder continuity with some modulus. Okay, but some but some fra fraction Holder, not not Lip, is Lipschitz expected? That's, that's sort of kind of what I was wondering. I would not expect uh, Lipschitz because I couldn't prove it in in uh, in our case. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but. Uh, I would have a question, and you were saying kind of with the continuity of the body map is related to the existence of geodesics, and I just wanted to know, is this an implication? So is it continu continuity of the body map implies no geodesics, vice versa? Um, I, oh. Well, I, all, all I can say is that in the counterexample, um, the, well, I mean, you, you, you make use of a, a sort of nasty geodesic to, I see. to be discontinuous. Yeah, I don't think there's an implication. Uh, okay. But, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, so now within the last five minutes, I'll try and tell you about uh, my results or our, our results. So uh, we don't do real analytic. That's that we haven't, uh, that's that's too difficult, but uh, you can look in, in at a, when N is Kähler uh, so that uh, so when N has a complex structure, then uh, you get this standard decomposition of the differential um, as with functions and forms on Kähler manifolds. Um, so the differential composes into one zero to one zero, one zero to zero one, et cetera, into these four parts, but they're actually complex conjugates of each other. So uh, the energy of a map is just 
uh, d of u plus d bar of u, where symbolically local coordinates, that's exactly what you expect from complex geometry. So the energy splits into two uh, factors. And now uh, if n is Kähler, then uh, the Kähler form of n the, <laughs> is closed. Uh, so therefore the pullback um, by, by the map is an invariant of the uh, homotopy class of u or even the homology class of u, um, which I call kappa. Um, and in fact, that turns out to be the uh, total d energy minus the total d bar energy. Um, on the other hand, uh, the total energy is the d energy plus the d bar energy. Uh, but as you see from before, that's just kappa plus twice the d bar energy. So uh, we can conclude that actually maps with energy close to this number kappa, uh, which is, as I said, a topological number, are almost holomorphic in the energy sense. In other words, the uh, norm, the L2 norm of d bar is uh, small. And since E of u is decreasing under the flow, this almost holomorphic in energy sense is preserved by the flow. So that's a, uh, the context that we, we study in our paper. Uh, we study the harmonic map flow as applied to almost holomorphic maps, just in the weakest sense, the energy sense, which is preserved by the flow, it's very handy. So you only have to assume it on the initial map and you get it for the rest of, the, for the rest of time. And there's an analogy here uh, between harmonic maps and 4D Yang-Mills where the curvature of a connection splits up into self-dual, anti-self-dual parts. Um, and you have the same property that the instantons are the minimizers. Um, and so in my thesis, I showed that the Yang-Mills flow actually exists for all time smoothly. If you start with a, a map that's close to an inst a connection close to an instanton in energy sense. Um, and also I, gen I, I managed to remove that in the end uh, in the Yang Mills context. So uh, I suppose the motivation for this work was to do the harmonic maps um, analog of my thesis. Um, okay, so let me now state our main results uh, and then we'll have to end. Okay, so uh, let's let Sigma be a compact Riemann surface and let's take a solution of harmonic map flow classical solution uh, up to a finite time, which of course is no restriction because uh, Struess solution is a concatenation of a finite number of those. We need to suppose that the target manifold is compact Kähler with non-negative holomorphic bisectional curvature. Um, and we need to assume that we're at an almost harmonic map. In other words, the d-bar energy of the initial map is less than some universe, some number that depends only on the target. Then uh, we, we obtain two bounds. We obtain an L infinity bound on the D bar part of the map. And we obtain an L2 bound on the stress energy tensor of the map. Um, so the stress energy tensor is this expression, du times du inner product minus half du squared G. And so that's a symmetric two form. Uh, on the uh, domain manifold, um, which arises in a certain way uh, and plays a certain role in, in the flow. Um, okay, so theorem one says that if we're almost holomorphic and the target has this curvature property, then in fact, we have these extra bounds. So this stress tensor is like a part of the, uh, the Dirichlet functional, I would say. Um, and so it would automatically be L1 bounded, but the statement is that it's L2 bounded uniformly after a, any small amount of time. Okay, and so remark is that this non-negative holomorphic bisectional curvature condition is the condition used uh, by Xu and Yao in their proof of the generalized Frankel conjecture, which was proven by Mori uh, almost a equivalent statement, I guess, uh, and then generalized by Mach uh, to say that any such manifold, uh, compact Kähler manifold 
with that curvature condition is biholomorphic to CPN if it's strictly positive or to a Hermitian symmetric space if, if it's just non-negative. But in our result, the metric doesn't have to be symmetric. Uh, so we just need a metric that has that curvature condition. Now the manifold is, is very restricted by that condition. Um, but so for instance, you can look at the results. You can take any metric on S2 with non-negative uh, curvature. Can think of that. And so the reason we need this condition is because we need a splitting of the Bachner formula, which requires that condition. Okay, so now theorem two is that uh, given the stress energy bound, we actually can improve the blow up rate. Um, so in Topping's counterexample, the blow up rate is as close to t to the one half as possible, but uh, given the stress energy bound, then we don't have that problem. We actually have slightly better than a half uh, blow up rate. And we have the continuity of the body map. Uh, and so we have C1 minus one over Q. If Q is greater than one, then that's that's uh, good. Q equals zero, uh, Q, Q equals one, the, the results don't work. Um, and we also have the connectedness. We have the no neck property. Uh, which is basically follows by the same estimate as the Holder continuity. So putting these two together, if we have U and N as in theorem one, so an almost holomorphic map to a, a non-negative holomorphic bisectional curvature, then we have the blow up rate O of T minus T. So not T minus T to the half, but T minus T. So that's in blue blow up rate and Holder continuity. In fact, we get C alpha for all alpha less than one in this uh, situation and the connectedness. Um, and I'll just say that uh, the blow up rate was studied by several people. Uh, the blow up rate in the rotationally symmetric case, for instance, Anginant, Bullshoff and Matano proved in the rotationally symmetric case that you have little O of T minus T. So we get a geometric proof that you have big O of T minus T. Okay, so I better stop. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Alex, for this 